Welcome to the Autism Outreach Podcast. I'm your host, Rose Griffin. We have an amazing part two today with Dr. Edith Strand. We are going to jump right in where we left off on part one. I wanted to make these a part one and part two because Dr. Edith Strand is an amazing speech language pathologist, an amazing contributor to the field, and she has so much information to share that I wanted to make sure that we didn't feel rushed in our interview. So if you want to hear all about apraxia of speech, dynamic assessment, intervention, and the importance of all of the above, you can dive right into this part two. And if you want to get the full scoop, go back and listen to part one and then come on over here for part two. I can't wait to get started. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. That's really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about the diagnosis of CAS in children with autism? Is there a higher prevalence or is there anything to, to be noteworthy of that? Because I feel like in the autism world, apraxia is talked about a lot. It sure is. Um, You know, we don't have real good data on that, Um, but certainly uh, I saw lots of children with the diagnosis of autism who had no apraxia of speech, but then we saw a a group of children who also had a dual diagnosis. Um, it's, It's very difficult to make a generalized statement that CAS occurs more in the autistic population than perhaps in other populations. We know that it occurs in some uh, disorders more frequently than in the general population. For example, galactosemia, velo cardiofacial syndrome, those have higher uh, incidences of apraxia of speech, but not necessarily autism, but we don't have real good data on that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Cause you know, people just talk about it. I was kind of curious about that. So can you talk to us a little bit about what is DTTC? Well, that's a treatment um, for apraxia of speech It's dynamic temporal and tactile cueing. And uh, it, <laughs> again, this is some, just because I was seeing so many of these children, right? I was, you know, as a clinician, we all do different things. And I knew that the techniques, the phonologic treatments that I knew and had learned weren't working at all. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing different things, basically influenced by all the work I had done in adult apraxia, Mm -hmm. where in our college courses, we do get information about treating adult apraxia. So I was trying some of those things. And uh, I read an article years and years ago by John, by Jay Rosenbeck on the eight step continuum of treatment for apraxia of speech. And it was just a hierarchy, a temporal hierarchy. So you say the word simultaneously with the, with the person with the severe apraxia. So you'd say me and you do it together until they could do it, say 90% of the time. And and you do that for five or six words. Mm -hmm. And then you'd move to, um, do it after me, me, me. And then you do it after a delay, me, me. And then you do it. I forget his whole hierarchy. They, there was, you do it, have him read a card. You, you do it some other okay. way. There are like eight steps. Well, I thought I'm going to try that with some of these kids that seem to have these same characteristics as the adult with apraxia. Right. And it just didn't work. Okay. And I thought, what is happening? Why won't this work? And it was one of those days where you drive home. You just say, <laughs> I'm just terrible at this. And, right. uh, well, I started experimenting, you know, and I thought, ah, you know, these kids have never talked. Adults that have a stroke and apraxia know what speech feels like in their mouth. They have mm-hmm. all the language. They've got this experience. These kids don't. So um, I started changing things where we would do it more dynamically. So I would say it, they'd do it with me and then we'd have to cue a lot more. Cue, cue, cue. Similar to the dynamic assessment, actually. The fact right. that the cueing from the dynamic assessment came from the work, from what I discovered as I was developing DTTC. And yeah. I didn't start out to develop this treatment. 
Yeah, it's fascinating. But, but, it, but you you just saw a need. That's what I think exactly. is so fascinating. I had um, Lori Frost on, who is the co-creator of PEX, you know, and I just, I love talking with her because like the business side of me was like, oh, how did it start? You know, and she was a school-based therapist and Andy Bondi, who is a BCBA, was her school psychologist or something. They were working together and they were working with autistic children and the students were not verbalizing and they had no other way to really communicate. And it was like, that's how Pex was born. And she was a school wow. therapist and she started using it. But I always love that because my mom always said, you know, if there's a problem, you just, you need to have a solution, right? That's how a right. business is started. And, and you just had an idea because you wanted to do better for your clients. You wanted to help support them. So I, I find this fascinating. So well, not only <laughs> the trouble is though, you get an idea and then it doesn't work. So you try something else and that works for a while and then it stops again. And then you have that. It took years to right. develop this, but luckily while I was working with these kids and doing everything I could to try to make this easier for them, the, we have a, a motor speech research meeting every other year, a conference on motor speech. And we always have an outside uh, speaker, a neurologist or somebody psychologist. And this mm-hmm. one year, gosh, this has now been probably 20, 25 years ago. Um, Richard Schmidt, who's a cognitive uh, motor learning researcher, wrote a seminal book in, in motor learning, came and spoke to us about these principles of motor learning. And it was like, why don't we know this? This is what we're trying to help these kids with improve their motor skill. Why don't we know these principles? We're certainly not incorporating them into our treatments. So that summer, I remember reading several, you know, just textbooks in that area. And then I started reading the literature and little by little, I incorporated what seemed appropriate for speech because all the research in that area had been done in limbs right. uh, into DTTC. And so it turned out that the things that seem most important are maximizing the number of practice trials, variability of practice, how you organize your practice, um, None of these things had gone into my planning of treatment when I was working in phonology or even uh, with the apractic kids. We just bring in a bunch of words. And that's where I learned, too, that they need to watch you because that visual cueing is so important. And that's when I got rid of all the pictures. And and then things happen so much faster. So little by little, I learned uh, about this whole other area of research, incorporated it into our work. And many, I'm not, many, many people now who, who work in the area of motor speech, everybody is well on board with these principles of motor learning. And it's guided a lot of our continued research over the last 20 years, to be honest. So wow. I'll send some references uh, about yeah. that as well. Well, it must have just been fascinating to, you know, because I, I have this different licensure called a BCBA um, with applied behavior analysis, but I love to be able to take that science with what I know from speech therapy and kind of put it all in together because there's less than 450 people in the entire world that have both of those certifications. So I love being able to kind of combine those. And and it sounds like you just did that on such an amazing level where, you know, you heard somebody talk. I can't imagine the credentials of people they were having to come talk to you guys about, you know, all the things. And, And wow, it was so fascinating, but you could see how that could be applied. And then did you just see such a growth and difference in the clients that you were helping to support? Little by little over the years, absolutely. And so by the time I got to Mayo and we started doing some treatment research, um, you know, then it became more solidified. And then finally, I felt confident enough, literally, it's more, I'm sure it was more than 10 years. Um, I felt confident enough to actually write an article describing it. And it got, it's, it's been published a couple years ago. So I'll put that in the references as well. So DTTC is just a, a treatment for severe, it's for severe childhood apraxia of speech, where you uh, follow this hierarchy which is dynamic. So it's similar hierarchy. You do it simultaneously, then direct imitation, then add a delay. And at each of those levels, you're also varying, after they get accurate, you vary prosody. Because, oh, I forgot to say that in characteristics, dysprosody is huge characteristic of apraxia. Yeah. Um, They segment often or have equal stress. So instead of saying like bunny, they might go bun knee or ba knee kind of thing. Lexical stress errors might occur also, but it's more often segmentation. So we built 
prosodic work in at every level. Mm-hmm. And then when they do so many in a row, you know, at a certain level, then they move to the next, to the next. And um, that's the the basic <laughs> structure of DTTC. But there's so much more to it because yeah. there's, you have to organize your practice in a certain way. There's a lot of suggestions for, about choosing targets, which is huge. Um, you have to be very particular with the severe kids about phonetic shape, movement, you know, the, the shape of movement, the context, the vowel, con, uh, the vowel uh, context, all those things. And, um, but all of that is included uh, in the article. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. So how is that different? It sounds absolutely fascinating. I love that it's very systematic and there's a lot of structure to it. And I just know for my, this is completely as an aside, but I do have, have worked with some older students. I had this one student who uh, was lived in another country for 10 years, came to the States, started in the schools. I met him in middle school. He had autism. He had no way to communicate, but what was absolutely fascinating about this student, I thought, oh, he's going to use a device like you know we'll try proloquo or something and then but he couldn't um point so he had no point his point was just no point so i worked with the ot to shape a point because that's just functional um and then i said you know what let's start some sign language and we'll also start some verbal imitation targets where i say something he says something. And what was absolutely fascinating about this student is that when he started talking he was able to say almost all the sounds that we can say. And it was just like, and I, you know, like I, on my small little scale here, like I presented at Asha about him, I've written an article um, for Asha Perspectives about him. It was just like my star student. It was like one of these things you're like, oh my gosh, this is speech therapy. This is absolutely <laughs> life changing. But what was so cool is that as he got older and we started putting different words and phrases together on a very small scale, you know, he didn't have a apraxia, but I was really analyzing all the different things that I was picking out for him. Like, he can say these things. And, you know, for him, like he had autism, it was like, okay, this has to be really functional, right? If he's going to learn 20 new words in a year, um, because he was older, middle school, high school, yeah, you know, yeah. they have to be such important words. Um, but it was just amazing for me to see that kind of growth. And it was really cool for me as a clinician, because I was really, really analyzing. And sometimes you don't always get to have that kind of student where you get to see that kind of growth or where you're, you're analyzing things at this level. You know, I don't always have the opportunity to do that. That, um, as a school-based therapist, it's really hard because there's so many kids who need your support. Yeah. Um, and I was devastated. That child moved last year and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I was like having a, I was having a moment. I was very sad. But um, so I love that idea that, you know, it kind of builds and it's, it's systematic and there's a hierarchy. It's a lot of um, thinking analytically because these things are so important for these students, especially when they have that severe, yeah. you know, because they, they may only learn so many words. So they're going to, they have have to be important words, right? Um, yeah, That's, I love that. One of the joys of working at Mayo is the the difficult the, the we we had always called them patients who came to Mayo um, had pretty serious issues, both the adults and the kids. So we had a whole uh, also programmatic research NIH funded big big grant on progressive apraxia of speech and primary progressive apraxia of speech, and the last you know, six, seven years of my work at Mayo, that that was a lot of what I did. And it was interesting to watch as these, this degenerative process happened. And I was also working with these kids where we're seeing this remarkable, you know, improvement. It was interesting juxtaposition, but, but, you know, what we were doing with the the a practic individuals where there was you know progression we would little by little meet their needs as needed by you know autism and other kind of functional communication kind of things whereas with the kids they were becoming more verbal and um, yeah. we're just we're just lucky aren't we rose that mm-hmm. i mean this this profession allows us to contribute something so important. I mean, isn't communication the most important thing in the world as far as I'm concerned? And we get to do that. It's, mm-hmm. I think sometimes we just get so bogged down. And I know that public school therapists are my heroes. You know, I only lasted about two years in the public schools because 
you know, you're so constrained with, you know, you got to do the IEP a certain way. And everyone knows you make a goal in October for next June or something. I, I mean, come on, that's crazy. But that's, you know, you're, you're sort of forced to, to do a service delivery mm-hmm. model that isn't right. always the best for speech anyway. It might yes. be for language and literacy, but um, it's, it, it's hard what we do. And sometimes we lose we get so involved in oh the paperwork and the meetings and the, that we forget that what we do is so important and we get to do that and these mm-hmm. kids are going to remember what we gave them I mean it's it's huge and I, I always want to when I'm talking to a group of people I always want to say don't forget that you know you're in a profession we're we're just so lucky to do what we do and yes, don't, yes. Don't the, I was going to say, don't let the IEPs and the meetings <laughs> you have to go to, don't let it get you down, you know? Right. Think about the work and try to yeah. focus on that. No, I love that because being a speaker, I do. I love it. You know, I'm a guest on a lot of other podcasts. And I remember one time somebody asked me, well, what do you do when you're having a bad day? I mean, and it's not like I've never had a bad day, but it's never, <laughs> I've never had a bad day because of the students. I mean, I've never, ever had a bad day because of the students. It's always something else. You know what I mean? It's like, other people. It's the paperwork. It's, it's all of those things. So, you know, I absolutely agree. Like I'm 20 years in and I still really love this job and I love this career. Um, I actually became a speech therapist because my mom was a teacher and she was teaching a career course at her high school. And she gave me a career survey. I was a senior in high school. I never had speech therapy. I didn't know anybody that had really. And it said I should be a speech therapist. So I observed, (laughs) I, yeah, I observed a family friend and we went everywhere. She worked in a nursing home. We did home health. I went to a school and like, that was it. I declared my major and I just never looked back. So I think it's cool. That is so funny, Rose, because I became a speech therapist because my mother went back to school to get her teaching credential when I was like 12. And she brought, she had to take an elective and it was the survey course in communicative disorders. And she brought home the textbook and I'm looking through it and there's all these pictures of kids with cleft palates and there's these people that had strokes. And then there's these people that helped them talk again. And I thought, right. wow, that's kind of cool. And it was science and service. I mean, it was mm-hmm. just, so I also, I wrote speech therapy down for my major, my freshman year of college. I mean, that is so, such a gift. And I've also never looked back, you know, our profession allows us to do so much. It, it was just very lucky. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that. Um, so DTTC, how is that different? How would that be different than some other uh, uh, treatment approaches that we might hear about for apraxia of speech? I feel like, you know, I'm kind of in this way different space than you. You're in this like researcher space, but I'm in this like Instagram, uh, TikTok, you know, everything social media space. And I feel like sometimes people are, you know, like I definitely read journal articles and I stay in the loop about all that because I make a point to, you know, it means a lot to me to, to be a lifelong learner, but sometimes people might just be picking up little things here and there. So, you know, how is that different than maybe something that they're just kind of hearing about um, out and about? Well, there are a number of ways that DTTC is different, primarily because it's focused more on the, on the severe apractic children. So Mm -hmm. it's not that we're, we're ignoring the language needs. And we often work in conjunction with school speech pathologists and sort of like the school speech pathologists do the language and literacy and we do the speech. Um, But I think the way it varies is that we're very careful to implement these principles of motor learning in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that happens in in a lot of, you know, treatments that are more uh, artic therapy or phonologically based Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. DTC also uh, utilizes a much smaller uh, set of targets as a, a motor learning principle we want to bring in some variability but not so much that we can't get get uh the movement uh learned you know build mm-hmm. that that movement um and then uh the organization of practice is very important so we'll use a, a block approach to practice but we know that if you go more toward random practice, you have better learning. So we start with blocks, we shorten the blocks for each target, and they'll all be at different levels. And um, then as they're improved, as the child's improving with that target, we'll reduce the, the length of the block of practice instead of 40 or 60 trials, we'll move it down to 10 trials, and then we'll have 
you know, only one block a session instead of two until finally we're just eliciting it spontaneously in response to a question. And then finally it goes to a maintenance phase. So that's all very specified. And that DTGC is different in, in that respect. I think using this modified block uh, approach to organizing treatment, being very careful in choosing the right number of treatment for the very severe or targets for the very severe kids, bringing in these, these this hierarchy of cueing and um, bringing in uh, these principles of motor learning. The uh, this, this idea of cueing, um, while there's a suggested hierarchy, we're also very careful to say you've got to fade these cues as quickly as you can. Right. You know, a, a, you, you can't get the gestural cue or slowing, you have to get a tactile cue, you know, open your, close your jaw a little bit because they always, you know, move the jaw. They're working hard, they're moving the jaw too much. Um, you have to fade that as soon as you can. If you stay with the tactile cue too much, they become used to it. Right. And later learning generalization is harder. So we we fade all the cues as quickly as possible. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good to know. So it sounds, it's with the, how specific it is, are there specific data sheets that you use when you're using this type of model? Or is it just you're using the, the, the principles of this TTC to then do your treatment? I'm just curious because I'm really sure. into data. So I'm just yeah. curious. Like, Well, in most of the clinical work, we're, we're, this is very important to always know what, what impact you're making. So we did probe testing. Okay. And if um, so, what we would do in terms of data, we don't take treatment data because we're too busy with this Mm -hmm. dynamic method. We've got to, you know, really get these responses. We cue them, we shape the movement, we give them quick rewards. You know, they'll take a little nerf ball and throw it in a basket after 10 tries. They'll Mm -hmm. stand up, put their hands in their head for the next 10, you know, whatever we have to do to keep them with us. Uh, As long as they're looking at us, uh, that's fine. Um, And then, say, every third session, especially for seeing in our intense work, we would have the, the children always came from a distance. So they'd come to Mayo and stay for a few weeks and we'd see them twice a day for half an hour. And boy, that if, you know, that never happens in the real world. And, right. um, and we could get, we could make so much progress with that intensity of treatment, especially if we built in variability of, of practice doing that. Um, but we would probe every third session. So sometimes it, that was good too. Sometimes it'd be the morning, sometimes it'd be the afternoon. And then we would take the treated probes. I mean, what we were treating, we'd take each target and randomly have them repeat them. So it might be boy, boy, me, me, hi, hi, no, no, whatever. And then we just did it randomly until we got five repetitions of each one. Okay. And then for each individual target, we would keep track of their score. And we used a multidimensional scoring system. You could do binary, but we did two if it was correct, one if it was one distortion or one distinct feature off, you know, one one little error, mispro- mm-hmm. misprocity, and then a zero if they had more than one little part. It's it's more defined than that. But and then we would add them up. So if they got two, 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 uh, one zero over those five, that's six, seven <laughs> out of the 10, right? Right. Um, so when they got eight, a score of eight over three probes, sometimes, you know, depend on the child. If I knew they were going to have a lot of good parent, um, mm-hmm. in our, if, if the parents were able to do a lot of the generalization work at home, Eight was fine. If we were working with a family where we knew there wouldn't really be any carryover or homework or any of the things yeah. we suggested, we might do nine or a score of nine to 10 over three sessions before we feel confident. Um, and that allowed us, and then we could just put it in an Excel sheet and chart it out and we could uh-huh. see where they were doing with each individual item. And then when they reached that criteria, it went out of training and a new item comes in. Okay. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Now, yeah. for research, you have to be even, right. you have to be more right. uh, data oriented. You have mm-hmm. to have 
fidelity measurements, mm-hmm. you have to have reliability measurements, all that sort of thing. So it's a, a whole different ball game there. But for clinical work, because you don't have money and time to, right. to do all the things you'd have to do in research, but right. you can you can take five to ten minutes every you know second or third session, fourth session if you see them you know less mm-hmm. more often. You have time to do that, and then quickly do the arithmetic. It takes five minutes, so you know that's that's doable for a busy clinician. I, I can imagine with, I was wondering with the people coming to you, I can imagine that they probably saw so much growth in their child's communication. I'm sure that you've have a lot of stories where, you know, especially if a child was maybe getting not the best treatment or treatment that wasn't frequent enough. And then they come to see you where parents, do you have a lot of exciting stories? Like parents were just very excited about the growth of their child's communication in that short duration of time. Well, we did. And, you know, it's not, I would, it was always careful to tell parents that, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I'm well practiced at it. Number one, number two, we did an intensive program with most of these kids. That's not available in most communities. Mm -hmm. If, If they're only getting treatment through the public schools, if they get it twice a week, individual, that's like, a gold, you're lucky, you know, right. mm-hmm. but it isn't enough for these severe kids mm-hmm. um, who really need more practice than that. So I'm careful to tell the parents, it's not me or my colleagues. <laughs> right. um, we have worked hard at this over the years, but it's the intensity and the right approach or a better, there's no mm-hmm. right or wrong, but a motor approach to treating this problem that's made the difference here. Um, so we would work hard with school districts around the country as they mm-hmm. came. And sometimes we were successful at, at getting more treatment. Lots of times we weren't. Uh, some states, Medi-Cal or Medicaid would pay for treatment. Other states it wouldn't pay at all. And mm. uh, children, some kids have insurance, some kids don't. I mean, it breaks your heart sometimes to tell you the truth. Just right. It breaks your heart. Yep. But, yeah, that's cool though that you're able to yeah, that intensive nature. I I love that that I'm sure that that was really exciting to see that to see that yeah. growth. Oh my gosh, I love that. So so fascinating. Where can people find it? This has just been such a wealth of information. Where can people find out more um about you and your work? I know you said you were going to give me some links and we can put those in the show notes. So show notes are things that okay. you write up on the abaspeech.org and also on YouTube and so we can include that. But um is there is there any website or anything? Well, I, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people keep asking me for the, my website. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm not good at that kind of thing. I, I don't do social media. I mean, right. I, I lurk on Facebook, <laughs> yeah, right, but, right. Yeah. but, um, I, I don't, you know, I got on Twitter when I was in Australia cause they did a group thing where people could ask me questions. Um, <laughs> but I don't tweet. Yeah. I, right. and it, it's just, I'm busy. I, I right. just don't know how I would do it. Yeah. 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 Um, I haven't made, and I have never had a website or anything, but I am going to say there is a website. I don't know how you'd find out more about me, but yeah. <laughs> um, you're, <laughs> but you can go to a website, uh, childapraxiatreatment.org. And I'll send this link to you. Okay. And that's where the, you asked about parents and right. their response to this. Um, there was a, a gentleman who brought uh, his daughter to Mayo and we were able to not only explain come to a diagnosis and explain it. It was a very complicated thing. And um, I worked with his speech, with the child's speech pathologist, and she just really improved quickly. And he was frustrated because why don't people know this? And I had to explain that we don't include pediatric motor speech in most of our university programs. So he has a big foundation and he included uh, childhood apraxia of speech in this foundation and asked me to do these courses. So for a while I did. And then I went and said this, you know, people come to a one day course or a two day course and they're hearing all this for the first time. They go back Monday morning. They have, you know, two IEP meetings and they have six, you know, teen kids in a row. They don't have time to digest or implement it. Mm-hmm. So we put it online and that's the course you may have seen or heard about. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. there is, uh, it is through this website, childapraxiatreatment.org and it's free and the CEUs are free. Wow. And then wow. If for some people that are really interested in apraxia, if you do a short reading list, take a pretty simple test, 
you can apply to come to one of our advanced courses, which if COVID ever goes away, will be in person again. And these are um, advanced. You know, yeah. you get up and talk about, pretend you're telling a parent what childhood apraxia is. Right. You know, how do you interpret this? What do you do? Where well, you have to really interact. You're not just listening to me talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're solving problems, very client-based, that kind of thing. So uh, that's that's one place to go for more information. Plus, I'll send you a lot of just okay. references. Yeah, and I think that's really great. I know we'll have to chat sometime because I know that I just get so many inquiries from parents about who is really specialized in a praxis of speech. And, you know, parents are just, they're, they're really seeking answers. You know what I mean? They really want somebody that um, specializes in this. So it would be really cool to be able to know some of the people that have taken your advanced courses. So maybe we can chat about that someday because I just have so yes. many parents, you know, then, you know, they go to certain places that they heard are good and then they interview the person and then they're like, well, that wasn't what I was expecting. And um, so I, you, there's just a lot of savvy parents out there that are doing a lot of research, um, especially just um, parents I talk to who have autistic children who are just, you know, yeah. really just learning a lot, taking courses online, want to get the the best help they can for their child. So um, it's amazing that people are, are specializing in there's this. There's two just, other, yeah. Let me give you two other things, especially for parents. Um, one is that an, another different, uh, same parent that, that, that I just talked about with a child apraxia, um, child apraxia treatment.org website also, um, gave Mayo some money so that I would be able to put together, uh, a, a video on CAS specific to parents. Oh. So it says we did it in a question answer format, just as if I was talking to the parent in my office. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are links to that, uh, through the Mayo, uh, YouTube, and it might just be on regular YouTube too. I'm not sure. But I have those uh, links that I can send you that you can post for parents. And also for parents, the um, Apraxia Kids website, Mm apraxiakids.org has uh, information for parents as well. Okay. Awesome. Well, gosh, Dr. Strand, this was just absolutely amazing. It was so fun to connect with you and just hear about all the amazing um, treatment and research and everything that you've contributed to the field and helped so many people. So thanks so much for coming on. Um, And thanks so much, everybody, for listening. This has been such a great uh, podcast episode. Make sure that you uh, subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss anything uh, great. You never know who we're going to have on. And write a review because I always love hearing from you. Thanks so much, Dr. Strand, for coming on. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye -bye. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.